I am Gary, and this is episode 194 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at electric vans. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to remind you of the EV Musings Patreon. Get early access to all episodes and, with an all-star or VIP membership, get a complimentary subscription to the paywalled EV Musings Substack with a bi-weekly newsletter and a bi-weekly article of interest in the EV or renewable space. Our main topic of discussion today is electric vans. Now, we've discussed electric vans before when we chatted with Simon Brace from the Lakes Electric Delivery Service. He has a Maxus eDeliver 3, which he uses to go 50,000 miles a year, delivering items all around the country. He'll come up a bit later in the episode. Today, I want to take a more holistic look at electric vans and where the whole sector's going. And to help me with this discussion, I'm delighted to welcome Paul Kirby to the show. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much, Gary. Yeah, delighted to be here. Now, you're known in the industry as the van man. So just give me a quick introduction, explain where people might know you from, please. Well, so I've been around the fleet industry for many years, uh, over a couple of decades now in vans, uh, particularly having first driven uh, a Mercedes-Benz electric sprinter back in 2004. More recently, I worked for Lease Plan, uh, a large global leasing company, focused entirely on commercial vehicles and then helped set up the strategy for Vanarama now under the auto trader banner for LCV and EV. And then about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I jumped into uh, the world of setting up your own business to support companies with training, consultancy and media, all to do with electric vans. But probably people have seen me on LinkedIn with my selfie stick and a camera talking sometimes rubbish, but sometimes sense on electric vans and walking in the woods and all the things like that. And I have a, a little sense of belonging there because if you recall at uh, Fully Charged Live in Harrogate, you, I don't know whether you'd forgotten your selfie stick or broke it and you used mine. So it was kind of, yes. <laughs> I think I almost forgot to give it you back. Uh, now, we talked to Vans to get today, which is a topic you know much about. So let's start big and work our way down to the detail. Now, when we talk about vans in this context, what specific sort of vehicles are we talking about? Because it's not your big 18-wheel trucks, is it? No. So the, the world of vans begins in a car-derived van. Um, so in, in the electric world, the Renault Zoe for a while was converted as, a, as an electric van. But, uh, but really, there isn't really many car-derived vans uh, on the market anymore. And we start with things like the Citroen Berlingo, which people will be very familiar with, the Vauxhall Combo and the like uh, of that. And then you move up to the medium-sized vans, which people would commonly know uh, as the Transit Custom-sized van. Van, but Vivaro E and um, other Stellantis products, the Maxus E Deliver 3 and the now coming out E Deliver 7, and then up to the bigger stuff, which goes up now to 4.25 tons, but that's possibly a separate conversation. Uh, but typically people would know it as a three and a half ton van, which would be your Mercedes Benz Sprinter or Transit sized vans. And those that's the sort of area where mainly uh, electric vans are operating. You can see derivatives of that with chassis cabs and even motorhomes these days, you know, uh, are beginning that sort of journey as well. So yeah, you can see a lot of variety, but that's the sort of broad breadth of it. Fantastic. Now I'm going to come back and ask you more specific detail about the different stratification along that. But do you have uh, statistics at hand about the sorts of numbers of vans on the UK roads, the number of miles driven, anything like that you can share? Yeah, I do as it goes. Sad as I am, I know that last year, <laughs> 57 point, uh, 57.5 billion miles, according to the uh, DFT, were driven in vans in general. There are nearly 5 million vans on the road. It's about 4.87 or something like that at last count vans on the road. Now, of course, these vary from vans that are going on the road being registered first today 
all the way through to 15 and 20 year old vans. So, uh, you know, a, a, a massive broad breadth. But what we see is a very marked difference between the, the vans being used in the first three or four years and then vans being used in, in, you know, in sort of later life, if you like. Whereas the first years, you would expect to see something like 20,000 miles a year on a van. In the later years, you'll probably see them around eleven or twelve thousand miles a year. So, it, you know, it's a there's very two, it's a market of two halves: the 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 relatively new operating within fleets and business, typically, and then the older vehicles operating in very micro SMEs. You know, one or two or three vehicles in their fleet. What is the current percentage penetration of electric vans in the marketplace? So, market. Market share month on month at the moment is about 5.5% of all uh, vans going on the road are electric. Uh, there's around about 60,000 electric vans on the road, uh, and they've been being put on the road for probably since around 2012, where the first Nissan ENV 200 and possibly then the Citroen Berlingo Peugeot X. Uh, Peugeot expert, yeah, were were coming on the road at that time. There's probably a few of those left around, and the Kangoo ZE was uh, another another favourite of the fleet. But th- they've been superseded now by sort of better, longer range product. Uh, but though a few of those will still be around, but the majority are probably in the last three or four years. To my untutored mind, those figures seem quite low in in the big scheme of things. But of course, yeah, sixty thousand electric versus however many million um mm, nearly five yeah yeah past- it's less than one percent oh sorry yeah i'm uh, sorry you were going to say how many electric passenger cars yes yeah so sixty thousand versus whatever it is one million uh electric passenger cars doesn't seem much but what's the is, is the percentage of electric vehicles as a proportion of the total number of electric vehicles uh, a total number of vans sorry uh, increasing at the same rate, or, or are electric vans lagging behind? They are definitely lagging behind. There's been a this has been a concern of mine probably for better part of twelve months. Every every year we've expected the J curve to start going up, and in fact, quite the opposite has happened. In that the the J curve has lost all of its uh, all of its energy and is now pretty flat. We've seen that for the last few months in just marginal gains and and even one month where the sort of month on month market share year to year went down so you know that that wasn't helpful at all and so vans are finding it more difficult than the the j curve of cars and that which you know the investment for the average car is huge on the part of the government because they're giving up a, a large wedge of benefit in kind, which means that not only do you get a lovely car to drive, which is fabulous and exciting, and once you've got in it, you know, very hard to, to sort of think, well, I'll go back to a petrol or a diesel one, and you get a pay rise to boot, the van driver that is just being paid to get from A to B to get a job done and doesn't get any benefit from that vehicle is not incentivized in the same way, nor is the company. So it's just a one-off grant of five thousand pounds. Whereas you know your average EV could probably cost the government between seven and ten thousand pounds over the first three years, and goodness knows as as that continues. So there's a big disparity at the moment between what is going on in the van world and what is going on in the car world. And the the barriers that are sort of up there to prevent or inhibit the the rollout of electric. It's it's a little bit more than what you've just talked about there. For instance, I had Lorna McAteer from uh, National Grid on the show uh, last season talking about fleets. And she was very clear to us that it, it's not just a case of, well, swap all your internal combustion engine vans for electric and stick a charger here and there. It's never quite that easy, is it? No, sadly, it isn't. I mean, the the, the way vans are used um, across different fleets, it, there's huge variety huge variety in it and each fleet is different and each fleet will have different challenges different needs different use cases but productivity is one of the critical things so you cannot afford really to spend time in a day charging a vehicle that it would just productivity uh, is really um, critical so what a typical van uses loses three or four days a year in typical maintenance terms 
But if you uh, wrap in two or three hours a week for charging, which would not be unreasonable if you were charging in the day and doing more than the range of that vehicle, so in, in therefore needing to charge, you would lose 20 odd days over the year. Now, fleets measure um, that cost of, of loss of productivity in a variety of ways, but Typically, according to industry in general, it can be anywhere between 500 and 1500 pounds a day for that lost revenue, that lost productivity. So you can see that that would really mount up in terms of cost base. Also, getting those vehicles charged out in the public domain is very, very difficult. And it's also quite costly for a business to pay at least the same as, but in often cases, many, many much more than the actual cost of diesel um, to charge on the public uh, infrastructure. It becomes not only unproductive, but very costly as well. You've also got things, issues around the overall range of the vehicle, um, how much weight you can put in them and how that weight affects. You've also got the disparity between summer and winter, which can cause um, some problems where fleets have bought the vehicle on the basis of the stated range uh, and are getting nothing like it. So it, it, there are a variety of challenges that our van community faces. Wow. <laughs> Don't know where to start with that. You and I were both at the EV Summit uh, recently, and I'm pretty sure you were there in the discussion where the guy from, uh, was it River Ford? The, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the vegetable people. The vegetable people. Now, I, I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head, but he said something like, from a maintenance point of view, the 25 vehicles that were fully electric on his fleet basically cost him five days maintenance across the year, whereas a similar number of vehicles at a, another location were, I think it was 80 or 85 days maintenance over the year. So yeah, I, I take the fact that if you're having to stop and do charging, there's going to be an impact uh, on that. Is that offset by the figures that I've just quoted about the the differential in maintenance on electric versus internal combustion? Yeah. So if you times that by, so it, it's about getting those numbers. So 20 days per van times 25, you, you do the maths, it's, it's 500 days if you lost that to productivity. The, the thing is, the guys at Riverford will have done their due diligence around how those vans get used, and they will be aiming to complete the day's route in, in you know within the charge of the vehicle and only charge that vehicle overnight. So that's, that's what the clever people do. They plan to use those vehicles. Now, that's not unusual. Most, the average, we, we talked about that 20,000 miles a year, an average van journey across a week will be no more than 80 miles a day. But it, it's dealing with the exceptions. So where you've got a, a longer journey. The thing, the good thing about vans is in many, many cases, they have a predictable route and they know what they're going to be doing and when they're going to be doing it because the, you know customers have expectations and ranges. It's the, it's the air times where vans have to operate you know, on the major road network, you know, up and down the motorways and things like that. And you've only got to travel on the motorway, um, you know, every morning to see uh, early in the day, how many vans are plowing down to, you know, various different parts of the UK. And it's often the STEM mileage, the, the mileage from home to work where the van has gone home overnight that um, is, is the, the high bit. And then the operation can be quite small, but then they have to go back. So it's those different challenges around the actual mileage per day. But if you can charge your vehicle and do the whole route in a day and come back and charge overnight, one, you get the benefit of cheaper energy, and two, you don't lose the productivity, and three, then you get the incredible benefits around the maintenance element, which you've referred to and which the guys at Riverford are benefiting from significantly. And I think a lot of what you've talked to there um, relates to what I would call the different use cases. Um, so let's sort of break that down a little bit and see whether we can stratify the market along vehicle <laughs> size lines. So talk to me about what's out there for your plumber slash electrician who wants something like a replacement for his Renault traffic diesel or, you know, the sort of small van that the post office use, a bit of storage, reasonable range. 
So, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. That it is that those types of operation, which which will typically be pretty local, so range is is less of a challenge. But you know, you think about the smaller van, very much similar to the the small vans running in the raw mail and so forth. There's vans on the road from uh, Stellantis Group, so that's Fiat, Vauxhall, Peugeot, Citroen. Uh, and and actually, they're sold into uh, Toyota as well. So there's effectively five brands on the market there. Small van things like the Bolingo, the Expert, the Combo, the Decat, uh, not the, the Doblo, and then the Toyota Pro Ace all do about 175 miles on a 50 kilowatt hour battery. Um, so if you can get the really cheap overnight energy, you could do the, the Ovo have just launched a seven pence per kilowatt hour for your d- charging energy. That's really low. So you're only going to be using seven times seven, 49, if I got that right? No. So yeah, for, yeah. So 49 kilowatts times seven is £3.50 for 175 miles. Um, although you'd probably get about 150 in terms of real terms range. So a, a really credible option there from from those guys, but also Mercedes-Benz with the E-Citan and Renault with the new uh, E-Tech Kangoo and the Nissan Townstar. And there is another uh, another one coming into that that space as well. But th- there's some really good small vans out there. And in the medium sector for your plumbers, um, your engineers, your builders, your in that sector, there's a great selection from again from the Stellantis Group, and also here we see really the first entrance of Maxus with both the Deliver Three and the E Deliver Seven, and they they're very credible products. And Renault are just launching their E Tech direct replacement for the traffic with, with an electric vehicle as well. So, and those vehicles can have up to 200 miles range. So uh, official range again, but, you know, wind it back a bit for the, for the summer winter scenario and for real world and, and for a number of other things, but, you know, 150 easily. One of the things, when I talk about use cases, one of the key differentials that sort of comes up in that discussion is we've talked there about your plumber, your electrician, your builder, they tend to be, I think you use the phrase SME, the small, medium enterprise. Uh, but if you then go up to what I would call the next big use case, we have the Amazon delivery, uh, the DPDs, that sort of thing. Now, I know that the Amazon guys who come to me have a minimum 35 mile round trip journey, even if I'm the only person that they're visiting and I'm never the only person that they're visiting, they're not going to go the shortest route. So what's sort of out there that a fleet can bring in that can cover the sort of miles you'd expect a a DPD or an an Amazon to deliver in a day? So typically, yeah, I know, I know the point that you make, but typically these vehicles are not doing large mileage every day. So I know some of the some of the vehicles that you know are doing thirty and forty thousand miles a year. Those are right on the edge of whether or not you can electrify currently. And what we've got to remember is that we're not looking. We'd love to, but we're not looking to electrify everything today. There is a a, a process for this uh, over the next seven to 10 to now 12 years, really where we will be able to migrate everything that's being sold today to electric over that period of time. So we're looking to find the the, the right vehicle for the use case today. And many of the, the types of drivers that you describe are on a very fixed route. They know exactly what their, their sort of location is, where they'll be doing up to 200 stops a day. And obviously the thing about stops is the regeneration of energy. So all of these vehicles have the ability to regen energy as they slow down by lifting the foot off the accelerator, the motor retards, and actually puts physical kilowatt hours of energy back into the vehicles. I was talking to somebody this morning that they were saying that on a daily basis, you can generate almost 10 kilowatt hours of energy from the driving that you're doing and the slowing down. So that helps support range. So whilst the stem mileage might be 35 each way, then they might get really good performance from the vehicle in the area that they're going to serve with their up to 200 drops a day. So they'll do all of those drops in a quite a dense and committed area, and then they'll tend to go back you know, to wherever they came from. And so 
it isn't actually that much of a challenge for the last mile delivery. The last mile delivery is probably the one of the easier areas if you can go back to a base and charge overnight. One of the easier areas to decarbonize with electric vans uh, of this type and and sort of the transit e or the the e transit is is probably good enough. I mean the the mileage is a little way off of its stated claim of 196. It's probably nearer the 150 in the summer and 130 in the winter. But then you've got the maxus range of vehicles with a with a number of different battery options there to suit the need of your business. So if you're only doing small mileage, you can go for the smaller battery. But if you need to do the longer mileage, you can pick a bigger battery. But the compromise is you can't carry as much weight with the bigger battery because obviously the batteries are bigger, they they weigh more. So there is a compromise to make um, around weight and range. And so understanding your needs in that case are really important. And there is another use case in here, which I'm personally very familiar with, and I've told this story on the, uh, the podcast before. Uh, during lockdown, uh, all my work dried up and I got a call from my mother who lives up in Yorkshire and down in Hampshire. She said, Gary, do you know the Morrisons next door to you is looking for delivery drivers? And my first question was, how do you know that? She says, I'm your mum. I know stuff like that. Uh, so I basically went and I got a job uh, delivering groceries for Morrisons. And at the time they were using diesel e-sprinters with the big refrigerated box on the back. And the, the interesting thing about that is that the mileage that I would do on any given shift was hugely variable. I think the maximum I did in one shift, and this is seven hours, is the best part of 200 miles. And the shortest I ever did in the same seven hours is 80 miles. So trying to electrify that kind of a, a route is very, very difficult because as well as needing the charge from the traction battery to keep the, the vehicle running, you've also got to draw on somewhere, presumably the traction battery, to keep both the fridge and the refrigerator working at the optimum temperature. So am I right in thinking that's the kind of use case where you're probably going to go, you know, we don't have a solution for that now. We'll push that one down the hill and work on it later. Or are there things that we can look at at the moment? You'd think, wouldn't you? But both the guys at Asda and the guys at Tesco are looking uh, at this, and and I know that they they've got solutions. I also know that Morrison's now have also got some electric delivery vans, um, with the fridge and and all of that kind of stuff on, because obviously they've got to keep the temperatures. So every challenge that comes along ends up with getting some technology thrown at it, and we deal with some of the things that that we need to overcome. So we've got lithium ion batteries that are added to the vehicle to just specifically provide support for the fridge to minimize the demand on the traction battery. We've also got solar that can be deployed to go on the roof of the vehicle and, and feed that, that lithium ion battery that then supports the, um, the fridge operation. So the, there are things already coming in terms of technology. And also what we're seeing is that Route planning and um, the opportunity charging um, kind of works quite well because the great thing about a delivery van for somebody like Morrison's, who you talked about, and Tesco and Asda and Sainsbury's, and I'm sure there's others available, they all come back to base and reload. And so if you've got the right if you've chosen the right option on the vehicle, you could have 22 kilowatt AC charging. That's available on most of the vehicles these days uh, as an option normally, or possibly go with um, some DC charging and, and deploy rapid DC charging, but you know, maybe at 25 kilowatts in order to spread the opportunity charging uh, availability. And then when that vehicle's back at base, reloading, re re restocking with food, you can put some energy into the vehicle to extend the range of the vehicle for that day. We're seeing that happen both that, you know, companies like DPD are doing that for their drivers to minimize their dependence on the public network um, because the public network is quite expensive and their owner drivers typically go home at night and you'll often see their vans at a, a Lidl's or a, a wherever it might be that 
charging their vehicles. But so opportunity charging and, you know, charging when they're stopped, not stopping to charge is a phrase that I, I think I have to attribute to the, the lovely Sam Clark. But, uh, you know, he comes up with all these natty little phrases. and that, But that is a perfect one. And it's a good example of when you're stopped, you charge. And if, as long as you've thought through your logistic scenario at your depot, then this works really well for the type of operation that we see particularly within supermarkets. And what you brought up there is a a very interesting point because at the basic level, your fleet charging splits into, it bifurcates the day of the word of the day, it bifurcates. Bifurcates, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you'll give an, an, an explanation of bifurcates for me, if not for the rest of the audience. It splits into two separate but aligned routes. Ah. Uh, you've, you've basically got, as you mentioned there, you've got depot charging. So the Morrisons, the, the Asdas, the Sainsbury's of this world, maybe even the DPDs potentially, they will have a depot that's set up to do an amount of charging, whether it's uh, overnight or whether it's, you know, you come in at a shift change, you get it done. And that's fine. There is obviously um, a cost aspect to that. But the other aspect of that is those fleets um, and I think Lorna McAteer talked about this when, when she was on the show. It's those fleets where even though there is a depot, the vehicles are not kept at the depot overnight. And you've then got the personal charging aspect. So, you know, your average van driver tends to live in potentially a detached house, apart from the plumbers. Those char- guys always seem to live in mansions, don't they? So, um, I mean, we hear lots of stories and you mentioned earlier that you you alluded to it about your friendly neighborhood delivery guys leaving their vans charging on rapids all night and blocking them up. Is that anecdotal? Is there an element of truth in there? What's the actual situation when it comes to to people charging on the public network because they don't have depots to go to? So, I mean, this is this is probably the biggest challenge that, that the van sector faces is that the significant portion of the vehicles that operate um, go home at night. There's one very large fleet uh, with over 1,500 vehicles. Uh, they only have three depots across the country and all of the other vehicles, the, all the vehicles that are in operation are almost self-contained workshops that that will turn up at our houses and and deliver the services that they provide, but then go home. So they almost never touch a depot. That is a real challenge for for Fleet because some typically our cohort of of van drivers, and we could be talking less than 20%, will have home or or off-road parking or the ability to charge at home. So it's a significant challenge because one, these are big vehicles. Two, you've got to have availability. And like if, like you said, the the DPD driver got there first and then the other driver comes along and tries to plug in but can't. And yes, I, I'm not sure that they're left overnight. They usually do get collected and, and, and are taken home. But you've still got this lag and the possibility of causing an issue for people, which people don't want at the end of a working day. You want to be able to just plug it in and get on with it. So we, we, we really do need to address the, the challenge of, of relatively slow. So it can be seven or 11 or 22 kilowatt charging by the roadside so that a vehicle can charge up overnight. And we are seeing innovation coming in that space where there's a great company called Tool, a guy called Phil Clark has created the battery that you can plug into the van, take your van home, leave it outside, and the battery that has been plugged into the van then transfers its energy into the traction battery that's fixed to the vehicle. So it's a really clever option. You can put in 50 kilowatts at the moment, kilowatt hours. You can transfer that energy overnight and then give the battery the battery back in the morning, and then that battery is recharged with renewable energy and and in an ideal world over, you know, through the day. And then you do the same every night. And and that is, these are the innovations that are coming to try and solve that problem. But, you know, with such a big cohort of drivers having to go home uh, every night with a vehicle that potentially could be electric, but with very minimal infrastructure at the roadside or, you know, outside, and even where they have a driveway, the private car would always trump that 
because you know from an insurance perspective or just a general comfort perspective they don't want the commercial vehicle on the drive and of course we've also got covenants where you buy your house and you say that the the estates won't allow commercial vehicles with livery and so on on people's drives so there's a lot of challenges to overcome uh, but there's a lot of good work happening the association of fleet professionals has provided some work there's companies like field dynamics kind of helping this whole world to understand where those vehicles will rest and therefore we can deploy charging to suit. And the public uh, public sector councils are, are being uh, lobbied or provided with that information so that they can put charging that will get utilization, but also that, that they can put in as a public sector where they don't need to make necessarily the profits that the likes of GridServe, Instavolt and Osprey would, you know, from deploying the same charging. Now you spend a lot of time talking with people who make electric vans and people who use electric vans. Mm. What I, you probably alluded to them already, but what are the key problems that you hear time and time again around the rollout? Is it the variety of the vehicles? Is it the charging infrastructure? Is it the total cost of ownership? Is it the maintenance? What are the things that are concerning people, fleet owners who wanting to go electric? You you hear the usual, so we have touched on them, but range. It's not enough. Total cost of ownership, it's too much. Weight, it's not enough. <laughs> Although all of, all of these things have answers, right? So the total cost of ownership is, is probably the one that is most relevant in, in some of the larger fleets in particular, but of course, even the small users. And there is this disparity between the, the purchase, the outright purchase cost of the vehicle and residual values struggling just a little bit at the minute to uh, that are causing that say monthly cost or the amortized cost over a period to go up and then to recover that cost in maintenance and energy you have to be charging them at the right cost so the once you get to sort of 30p a kilowatt which is broadly what we would pay typically and it's very there's wild variance in the cost of energy from as low as 7p as i alluded to earlier to higher than a pound per kilowatt hour. So it's very, very difficult for fleets to really measure that to total cost of ownership with any degree of consistency. Um, so the total cost of ownership presents a challenge. Now there are big incentives, contract wins, getting into sort of the clean air zones, which can then reduce that cost of ownership. But um, the, the, the ESG elements of contracts, the environment, social and governance, sort of dictates from the bigger companies or the councils or the government to run a zero emission vehicle to win a particular contract to certainly incentivizing fleets to dismiss or price in the total cost of ownership to win the contract. So then range, range becomes a bit of a challenge, you know, if you're doing longer journeys, but again, most of those can be sorted out in, in many cases. And then you've got the weight challenge, and this is where you have to consider this 4.25 ton derogation, which there's a degree of confusion about still, but the government are acting on it and giving us a, some elements of clarity. So we can drive a vehicle that is heavier or allowed to be heavier than it used to be to compensate from the weight of the batteries. And actually, if you do use that kind of derogation, you can actually put more on your vehicle than you could before, you know, when you had a limit of three and a half tons uh, as, as a gross vehicle weight, the maximum weight a vehicle could weigh. So there are moves afoot to, to answer all of the challenges, but those challenges of range, total cost of ownership and how much weight can I put on them, but also the where can I charge it? That's, I think that's critical. Have I got enough power in my depot? Can my driver charge it at home? Do I need to change my business model? There's a lot of big questions being asked of the market at the moment. And in the commercial world, it's a real challenge to answer those questions. There is answers, but there's also not enough information in the marketplace and the manufacturers aren't necessarily getting all of the information to all of the people that need it in a way that helps them make an informed choice. A lot of good information there. Where, in your opinion, is the biggest bang for the buck for the adoption of electric uh, vans? Is it getting the fleet charging aspect right? Is it getting the affordable vans with the 
with the right range? Is it the pricing on public charging? Is it the ability to get on-street charging? Which one of those would you prioritise as being something that should be? I, I was just going to say yes. <laughs> well, listen, you know, one of the, the things I'm working on at the moment is a plan for vans. And I'm not alone in that operation. I'm working with the, obviously the EV Cafe, which I'm a part of. We, a lot of our partners are bought into helping this challenge around the van community and, and uh, organizations like the BVRLA, Logistics UK, the Road Haulage Association or RHA, the Association of Fleet Professionals. There is a lot of, of, of coming together on this challenge that we have to electrify the van world. If I was to put two things out there that are not the vehicles, it would definitely be the ability to take a van home and charge it. So, you know, exciting innovations from companies like Tule are great. It would equally be good to see lots of on-street charging, um, even lamppost charging, as much as some people dismiss it, I think it's got its place. And, you know, lamppost stroke curbside charging in in areas where van drivers might live. And that's where companies like Field Dynamics and the Association of Fleet Professionals can help councils deploy that charging most effectively because they've done research on where the vehicles are stopped for long periods of time. So that we know that the chargers would get used, but then that public cost of charging here in the UK is a big challenge for me. You know, if you go on the continent, you can go on into some of the public charging networks over there, particularly in the Nordics, and you'll see costs as low as 25 cents but for DC rapid charging uh, per kilowatt hour. And where we're charging 85 pence or they're about 70%, 70 pence. So it's a significant difference and we need to level that playing field so that, that drivers can use that. The vehicles themselves, I think, you know, we're, we're beginning to answer many of those questions. We're still struggling a little bit on range and the disparity between summer and winter causes some degree of challenge. I think generally the speed of charging and overnight charging is, is getting to a place and Stellantis are starting to really accelerate you know, the, the answers to those questions with big vans going to be able to do around 250 miles. That should be pretty exciting. Um, and also extending the range of their medium sized vans as well. So we're seeing lots of development in the vehicles and the vehicles I think are being looked after. Iveco have got a, a great uh, answer to some of the, the more technical problems around taking power from the vehicle to, you know, power a cherry picker or a digger or a, um, some, you know, physical equipment from the back of the van. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff going on with those guys and also answering the challenges around range. So I think it is about the infrastructure that's surrounding that, that I would probably major on. Sorry, that's a very long answer for a very simple question. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. But it does raise the question in my mind of, because yeah, I was chatting with someone earlier on and he said, you know, we live in an EV bubble and you know, we're very positive for a lot of EV things and we know where the issues are that, but obviously the real world does not live in that same bubble as us. Is your feeling that the general sentiment about electrifying vans is the way to go? Or is it the same as the way they've electrified cars where the people like you and I who are here in the bubble, we know that it's good, but there are a lot of naysayers outside. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I did a great project for a company, Ford Fleet Management asked me to go and talk to the man on the street. And I, I took I took my uh, Ford E Transit and parked it in the middle of Wix and B&Q car parks. Other DIY sheds are available. And, uh, and invited people to come and talk to me. And it was great fun. You know, people would drive in, you know, I've got electric written down the side of the van and a guy sort of wound down his window as he drove past. So shouted out the word, diesel all the way. And I said, oi, get over here, you come and come and justify that statement. Um, and we talked and I think there is so much misinformation out there. We, we know that the press are, are giving us a hard time. Part of me says rightfully, because I think we, we um, exchanged some comments on a, a, on a LinkedIn post that you know, the press aren't for us, but we are making it slightly easy for them to kick us. 
by not providing enough information, by not accelerating the, the, the knowledge and the information out into the marketplace. Bums on seats sell vehicles. It's as simple as that. People experiencing an electric van will help them make a really positive decision because they're so much easier to drive, so much nicer place to be. And if operated correctly, you know, we've talked about the in-life benefits in particular, and we're going to see prices come down. We haven't really touched on the ZEV mandate today, but the ZEV mandate is going to drive manufacturers to get the price right so that people can buy them effectively, that we will see the price of diesels going up, I think. We'll see the, the, the price disparity between electric and diesel come together, but not necessarily just because the price of of, of the electric van has gone down, but the, the diesel van will go up. So I think we've got to get information into the marketplace because all of those people that I spoke to, as much as they were quite dismissive initially, were, well, yeah, we know electric's the way forward. And these are people on the street. These are your butcher, your baker, your candlestick maker, the people that are, you know, repairing our gas boilers, that are doing some work around our houses, building walls, putting in windows, you know, plumbing our bathroom in or whatever it might be. They're doing all those great things, but they know. They know that actually we need to be more sustainable. They're just worried about price. They're worried about where they charge it. They're worried about how far they can go. If we can get information to them and the price is more equivalent to what they're used to in terms of that total cost of ownership, we've got to re-educate on that, then they will be happy to buy. But there is a lot of naysayers out there. You know, I put a post out about some uh, an electric motorhome or camper van and, you know, comments like you're buying an incinerator were, were, were made with regard to that, that, that post. And you're like, buying an incinerator? What, we're going to go up in flames? I'm buying my own crematorium. You know, those comments are just unhelpful and they're so misinformed. But we, we have a duty to educate and, and we need to help people. And I, that's why I like to spend my time talking with people that don't run electric vehicles that are not in that bubble because actually talking to the church is very dull. Well, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. But I think one of the things that comes out from talking to the church is we get people like friend of the podcast and former guest Simon Brace from the Lakes Electric mm, Delivery love him. Service running a Maxa C Deliver 3, I think, covering upwards of 50,000 miles in a year using mostly public charging when he's out and about, he's made it work for him. So it, it's a great example of, of somebody you can hold up and go, look, you've got questions. This is the guy who can answer them because he's been there. He's seen it, done it. And Simon is a, is a great example. I've, I've known Simon really since we started the EV Cafe po uh, the EV Cafe webinar. And he he joined it early on as, you know, his business dried up as, as lockdown kicked in and, and everybody jumped online. Uh, and we, we had lots of good chats and he's, he's joined me at Fully Charged on a number of occasions with his van with uh, no engine left in this van overnight, <laughs> which I love that. <laughs> it's a great stick of that, isn't it? It is, yeah. And so he's a great advocate and, and I think it's people like Simon that are educating people one by one. Yeah, there's a great story about starfish on the beach, isn't there? I don't know if you've heard it, but there's a there's a man walking along a beach throwing all these thousands of starfish have been washed up on the shore. He's picking them up and throwing them in the sea and and somebody comes up and says, How can you make a difference? You know, look at look at all these starfish. And he picks up another one and throws it in the sea and says, I made a difference to that one. And you know, if we take that attitude in life as a whole, in every aspect of it, but in particular with electric vehicles, if we can all just help one more person move to electric, then they become an advocate. And it's, you know, it's not an, a mission without real purpose. We're, we're improving air quality. We're reducing the impact on our climate. We're improving the, uh, the nation's health genuinely. You know, there are multiple billions being spent every year on keeping people healthy with air quality related health issues. This is not a mission or a purpose without any real meaning we are doing something positive and you know we can all hug a tree right and all that kind of stuff and not about that but this is making tangible difference and and if we can just help and just educate and just give some hope to that that one 
then we've done our job uh, and we can just keep doing our job on a daily basis. And Simon's a great example of that. That sounds to me like a very, very good point to draw this discussion to a close. So, Paul Kirby, thank you very, very much for your time. Gary, it's been a delight. Thank you. A couple of takeaways from this. Paul and I are both aligned on the fact that we need to to be decarbonising fleets and vans quicker than we are. Last mile deliveries, Royal Mail, National Grid, grocery deliveries, etc. These are all fleets that constantly have vehicles out on the road every day of the working week and often longer. I personally think, in hindsight, if fleet electrification had been started before private car electrification, we would be much closer to our goals and EV uptake would have had less resistance than it is having now. Plus, a lot of the infrastructure would already be there to charge the vans and this would have given car drivers confidence that the infrastructure could support them. Secondly, all seemed very bearish on fleets. Various factors have played into the fact that fleet electrification isn't going as quickly as we would like. Lack of home charging for many van drivers who take their van home, the need to be able to run a van all day without losing time to stop and charge, and cost issues are also factoring into this. It has to be said though, when Lorna McAteer from National Grid was on the show, she mentioned that they don't provide home charges for their van drivers. Many of them don't need them as they spend a lot of time at transformers and substations where a simple 7 kilowatt charger has been installed which charges the van as the guys are working. Many thanks to Paul for his time. Paul can usually be seen most days with one of his famous selfie stick videos on various topics of his choice, as well as in the EV Cafe News every Friday at 10am on YouTube and LinkedIn. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. Berlin's underground car parks are producing so much heat they could power thousands of homes with clean geothermal electricity, according to a new study. The heat given off by car engines makes the city's car parks hotter than the surrounding earth, which in turn raises the temperature of the groundwater. Now, obviously, this isn't great, but in the spirit of, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade, the city is using heat pumps to extract the energy and use it to heat homes. In Berlin alone, enough energy is transferred to the groundwater to supply 14,660 households with heat, based on modelling from over 5,000 underground car parks. In an ideal future, when the majority of vehicles on the road are electric, this won't be as applicable. But in the interim, it's an excellent example of using waste heat to reduce bills and provide energy. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by Zapmap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV driver search, plan, and pay for their charging. Zapmap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using ZapMap in car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've got an electric. It's available on Amazon worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've got renewable is also available on Amazon for the same 99p and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you got to this point by tweeting me at MusingCV with the words The Van Man Talks Vans Man. Hashtag if you know you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know I often wonder whether one source of income for him might be to commercialise the whole electric unicycle thing. Get a custom designed electric unicycle made and try and sell it to somewhere with a big audience base. Problem is I'm not sure what the mass market is for that. Asda and the guys at Tesco are looking uh, at this. Thanks for listening.
Bye.